Well, good morning and welcome to the Bridge Church. Whether you're here in person or you're watching online, we're so glad that you chose to spend Easter Sunday. Anybody else in the house hype this morning? Let's give God some praise. Yes. Woo. Man, it's awesome to be here. I'm so glad uh, that you uh, chose to spend a few minutes with us. If you're new here to the Bridge, I see a lot of new faces. And I just want to say thank you. Thanks for coming out and being a part of this uh, we would love the chance to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, the best way we can do that is if you take a moment, uh, the Connect card that was on your chair when you came in, or for those of you who are watching at home, if you text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen, then it's down here, then you'll see that, and, uh, and that's just a great way for us to know who you are, uh, where you're coming from, uh, get to know you a little bit better. If you are here in person and you fill that card out this morning, uh, we have a gift for you, uh, our bag of swag. If you stop by our Connect Desk on your way out, see Jessica there, and she'd love to give you a little gift from us to you, just our way of saying thank you for coming and being a part of this this morning. I did want to mention a couple things before we jump into the message. Uh, first of all, the service times for today are going to continue to be our service times moving forward. So we did a little shift, uh, 9 and 11 a.m., so either one, uh, we've got pretty equal distribution across the services. Uh, if we continue to run uh, at capacity, kind of where we are right now, then we'll probably be looking at a third service, but we'll let you know as that comes. For now, uh, this is where we're at, and I did want to tell you, next week, how many of you like a good party? Anybody out there? Good barbecue? Come on. Uh, next week, we are celebrating springtime, and just, you know, as things are starting to look a little bit more hopeful, uh, we just want to get together, uh, have a chance for us to meet some new friends, and so next week following the 11 a.m. service, uh, we're going to have a block party here. So we're going to have games set outside, activities for the kids, we're going to fire up the barbecue, come on, and uh, just have a great time hanging out. So we'd love for you to come back next week and be part of that. Come yourself and bring somebody else with you. Um, who doesn't want to have a good time like that? All right, um, so just don't forget those things, those are important. Uh, I, I did want to also give you the opportunity uh, right now, we've already worshipped, uh, many of us have worshipped this morning. Uh, through different serve opportunities. Uh, we've also worshiped through song this morning. I want to also give you the opportunity to worship through giving. And j just to make sure you know what this is all about, some, some of us grew up in churches and maybe you felt um, guilted into giving. We want you to know the Bridge Church is a guilt-free zone. Uh, we don't want anybody to ever be compelled to give because they feel guilty. You have no, no uh, obligation or guilt. Uh, we give because we want to follow the heart of God. And, you know, we celebrated that this week, Jesus dying on the cross. That was God's ultimate gift to humanity. And he showed us what it really means to be generous. And we want to live lives marked by generosity. And so we look to do that in so many ways. We want to be a blessing for this community. We are for Hamilton. We are for Mercer County. And when you give as a community, it helps us to give uh, to others who are in need. So I just encourage you this morning, uh, if you're new to the bridge, again, feel no obligation. You want to give this morning? Great, but feel no uh, obligation to do so. You can do that a few different ways. You can text to give. Uh, you can give online, or you can go old school, uh, fill out an envelope, or just drop cash in the secured boxes uh, that you'll see as you're leaving either door in the back of the auditorium. So just something to mention. Uh, I want to pray now. Uh, for the offering, and then we'll get right into our message for today. God, thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, this moment to, to celebrate you are, in fact, the way maker. God, God, when you came to this earth and, and you took on human form and then you went to the cross, you paid the price for our sins, you were the ultimate way maker. And God, you proved what it meant to give of yourself. And so today, as we have this moment where we just worship you through giving, may we be reminded, God, that this is, this is not something that, that we do out of guilt, that, that we want to follow your heart, and we want to be uh, just like you in this area. And so we pray, God, now that you would take this offering, that you would take this gift, and that it would just be part of our worship this morning. 
We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was thinking back over the last year, and if you kind of travel back in time with me, uh, you'll remember that it was around Easter time uh, when this pandemic really started to just turn our world upside down, right? I mean, a lot of things that we were used to doing and life as normal, just it, it no longer was there. And I remember when we had to make the pivot, we had to make the decision to shut down in-person services. We had never before videoed one of our uh, Sunday services, and suddenly that was our only means to communicate with our audience. And what a year it's been. It's been a challenging year, to say the least. So not only have we dealt with this pandemic, which unfortunately is still around. Yes, things are looking hopeful, uh, you know, over the coming weeks, months. Hopefully we can retor- return more to what we know as normal, but we're not there yet. That coupled with some of the other things that we've been dealing with over the last year. I think about just the racism that has, has become so apparent that, that we've, it's really become front and center for all of us today. And here, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking to know that that reality exists in our world, but it's still very much there. And then, uh, I think about the election that we just went through, and how, as we came out of that election, or even in the midst of it, just how divided it made us all feel. It's been a tough season, hasn't it? It really has. So many people have have been brought to the place where they just feel dark and and depressed and down about life, maybe even lonely. And maybe that's part of what has caused you to tune in today online or to be here with us in person. And, And I think that where we find ourselves today, it it makes the message of Easter so relevant to us. Because when you think about it, it really addresses our deepest fears. And we're faced with those right now. They're right in front of us. Is my family going to be all right? Does does God know what's going on? Does God even care? Does God even hear my prayers? Perhaps the only time in history where Easter has been more relevant than it is right now was the very first Easter. So I want you to think about that right now. What it must have been like that first Easter. You see, we we have the benefit now of looking back and knowing how the story ended. But if we had been alive 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died, our hope would have died with him. Because when Jesus died, hope died. When Jesus died, nobody believed that he was, in fact, the Son of God. Nobody believed that he was the Messiah, the promised one. Nobody was there believing that. There were no Christians because there, were no, there was no Christ. There was a brokenhearted mother. There were some really bewildered Galilean fishermen But there was no Jesus. There were no Christians. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were the ones who actually took Jesus' lifeless body off of the cross. And they ended up taking it to a a tomb, sort of a cave that belonged to Joseph's family. And they put that body in the tomb. And then what did they do? They left. Why? Because Jesus was dead. No one was planning to keep this dream alive. Nobody was planning to keep the movement moving. If Jesus couldn't keep himself alive, then then what was the point in all of it? If Jesus couldn't keep himself alive, what's the point in keeping the movement alive? After all, he wasn't who he claimed to be. And that was was a huge issue. That, that That was enormous to them. Because what what kept this group together, what caused these these men and women to follow after Jesus, it, it wasn't his teaching per se. It was actually his outrageous claims about himself. 
claims like that he had the ability to forgive sins. I mean, who has the ability to forgive sin? Claims like he was better than Abraham, Moses, that, that he was better than the, the temple. I mean, these would have been shocking for them to hear in this day. It was this claim that he had, the authority that he had. It drove the religious leaders absolutely crazy. Peter and, Joseph, uh, Peter and, and the disciples, they didn't choose to stay with Jesus because of what he taught. In fact, sometimes they chose to stay with Jesus in spite of what he taught. I'll give you an example. You know the story of Jesus when he fed the, the 5,000? You remember that story. Maybe you grew up in VBS or Sunday school or somewhere along the way. You heard the story. Jesus is there. There's this huge multitude of people. It's like this giant rally, and it's the end of the day, and people are starting to get hungry and, and cranky. Uh, and, and Jesus sees this. He knows there's a need. He steps in, and he does this incredible miracle. He takes this, this lunch of this little boy, and, and with just those uh, meager uh, uh, things, he feeds a whole multitude of people. It's an absolute miracle. People are blown away to the point where right there, they're ready to declare him king. Because that's what kings do, right? They feed hungry people. But then things take a turn. Things, things start to, to go a different direction. And, and so as Jesus feeds the thousands, they, they end up getting in a boat and they go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and when they get to the other side, guess what's waiting for him? More people. And so Jesus decides to take advantage of this moment, and he begins to teach. He begins to share, and he makes this statement, this claim that blew people away. He says, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. Imagine if somebody said that to you. Hey, Bill, I'm the bread of life come down from heaven. You would think they were nuts, right? Like, who do you think you are? What makes you so special? You're the bread of life come down from heaven? And to complicate things, Jesus was from this area. So this is like somebody who grew up on your block. Like I grew up in the Berg. Any other Berg people out there? I grew up in, you know, in that area. And, and this is, this is, these are people that saw Jesus grew up. They knew Mary. They're like, I was in the PTA with her. God, the son, of, you came from heaven? No, you came from Mary. What are you talking about? You grew up right down the street from me. And so as he says these things, suddenly the crowd starts to thin out. And as, as, he, as the people begin to disperse, Jesus turns to his 12 disciples, his closest followers, and he asked them this question. Are you going to leave too? Are you going to leave too? Well, Peter, Peter steps up and he's sort of the spokesperson for the disciples. And, and he responds to that. And what he doesn't say to me is as telling as what he does say. He, he doesn't say, Jesus, Jesus, we can't leave you. I mean, you're teaching. It's so incredible. You're, there's not another order in the world like you. Nobody has your ability to communicate the way you do. Nobody says such profound things as you. Now, granted, today was a little, you know, lesser performance. But nobody bats a thousand. Like, we're not going to leave you because of that. That's not what Peter says. What Peter says is this. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Sit on that for a moment. You see, Peter, the disciples, they had come to the place where they began to believe that Jesus was who he said he claimed to be. They had come to believe that he was, in fact, the Holy One of God. And here in this moment, after the, the death of Jesus, suddenly there's this overwhelming realization that they 
were wrong. They were wrong because surely the, the Son of God, the Messiah, the promised one, the Savior of the world, couldn't be killed by mere mortal men. There's no way that execution could take place. They must have got it wrong. They must have misunderstood something or Jesus was just a fraud. Something was wrong because what they know is Jesus was dead. And they fully expected Jesus to do what dead people do, stay dead. Imagine the disappointment that they would have felt in that moment. Have you ever had somebody that you really respected, somebody you really loved, who betrayed you. Maybe they lied to you or they hurt you in some other way and, and you know the pain of that. Maybe it was a church leader. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe, maybe somebody at work, a close friend. But somebody who, who, it was devastating. This is the emotion that these men and women must have felt in this moment. And so what do they do? What do they do? How, how do you respond to this? Now, now think about this. No one was standing outside of the tomb counting backwards from 10 on that Easter morning, right? I don't know if you knew it. Yesterday was 4-3-21 or 4-3-2-1. How cool is that on the Saturday leading up to Easter Sunday? Like, we get that now because we know how it ended. But back then, nobody was there counting down because they expected Jesus to do what dead people do to stay dead. And with Jesus, hope died for them. So what are they left with? They've got this absolutely corrupt religious system. They're, they're being... Uh, ruled by a, a foreign government, oppressive government, with, with a leader who can't wait to skip town after Passover. You've got some really sad Galileans, but you have no Jesus. There were no believers. When Jesus died, hope died with him. And then something happened. Then something happened. That morning came that sealed the promise. His buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared, he has no claim on you. He has no claim on me. Yeah. I love those lyrics that we sing to those songs. In fact, we're going to do that in just a few minutes. You see, Easter has never been more significant to us than it is right now. We celebrate the event that launched the movement. The event that eventually brought us the Bible. Now, it's really important that you get these events in the right order. Because if you don't, it can get confusing, and it can even make your faith fragile. Some of you here are, this, are here this morning, and you're struggling to believe. You're struggling with your faith. Maybe you've opened up the Bible, and you've read things that just don't make sense, that you don't like, that you don't understand. And because of that, you're thinking, I can't possibly believe. Hear me when I say this. That the, the Christian faith doesn't begin with the Bible. It doesn't begin with Genesis. The Christian faith began with Jesus. It doesn't begin with his birth. It doesn't begin with his teaching. Those things are all important. But hear me. It began with the resurrection of Jesus. There were no Christians until after that happened. There were no believers until after the resurrection. The Bible didn't create Christianity. The, the, the Christians didn't create Christianity. The resurrection created both. And that is why we celebrate today. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, well isn't, isn't, isn't the way that we know about the resurrection from the Bible? I mean, that's what I thought. That's, 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 what, I, that's what I've heard, right? 
Isn't that actually how we know about the resurrection? The answer to that is actually no. The way that we know about the resurrection is we have multiple eyewitness accounts of people who had every reason to run away from Jesus. People who had spent the last few years of their lives following him, now who were in this moment of disappointment, and he could have cut ties right then and there, no longer being associated with Jesus. But no, no, they recognized that Jesus was the risen Savior, that he had conquered death. And they give us these eyewitnesses account. We, we read about it in the Gospel of Matthew and in Mark. Mark got all of his information from Peter. And we read about it from the, the, the perspective of Luke, who was a medical doctor and a historian. It says that Luke went through and, and he personally, personally interviewed every single witness. These were people who were there firsthand. That they saw Jesus in his risen form. You see, the Bible didn't create Christianity. It didn't create Christians. The resurrection did. We have the Bible because of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would be no Bible. Why? Because the story of Jesus is only worth telling because of the resurrection. And man, is it worth telling. Peter shared it more than 30, for more than 30 years. He told of that extraordinary morning when, when he and John peered into that empty tomb and saw with their own eyes that Jesus was not there. Later in his 50s, he was waiting execution in a Roman prison. And it was there that he and Mark are traveling together. They're in prison together. And Peter begins to tell this story one more time. And Mark records it for us. And this is what he said. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, like the Supreme Court, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. He went boldly to Pilate and he asked him for the body Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. So summoning the centurion, uh, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned uh, that it was so, then he gave the body to Joseph. And Joseph brought some linen cloth and took down the body and wrapped it in linen. And he placed it in the tomb, cut out of a rock, this giant rock. And then, inside, then he rolled this stone, this enormous stone, against the entrance of that tomb. And then Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, they saw where he was laid. And, and as they did, as they did, when the Sabbath came, it was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, they brought spices so that may, they may go anoint the body of Jesus. Why? What did they expect to find at that tomb? The body, right? Because they thought he was dead. But what did they find? They get to that tomb. As they make their way, and, and suddenly, very, first on, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they're on their way to the tomb. They ask each other, who, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But they looked up, and, and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. I would be too. He said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He is not here. See the place where he laid. He is not here. He is risen. He's risen. See the, uh, but go and tell his disciples and Peter. I love this. I, I relate so much to Peter. So many of the things that you see in Peter, I see in me. He says, make sure you tell Peter. Make sure he knows what you just experienced here. Peter needs to know about this. Peter needs to hear this. 
Go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you. Jesus is going ahead of you. He's going to meet you in Galilee and you will see him just as he told you. So what do those women do as they encounter that, that, that being in that tomb? What do they do? They go back, and, and sure enough, they tell the disciples, and Peter and the other disciples, they, they, they go and see for themselves, and then they go to Galilee, and it's there that they meet our risen Lord. Now, I don't know this, but I like to think that perhaps the spot where they meet Jesus again is where they met him for the very first time. Remember that when he said, come follow me, I want to make you fishers of men. And they're like, what? Okay, interesting. That, that it goes back. You, do you remember the place, if, if you're with a significant other, where you first met your significant other? You remember going back to that place and it just kind of takes you back to that moment? I wonder, I don't know. But I wonder if that's not what's happening here. Jesus meets with them again. They're on the beach, this intimate setting. They're having breakfast together. And suddenly the realization comes they thought they were right, and then they thought they were wrong, but now they know that they were right because Jesus is alive and he's with them. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, and Peter were standing here today, I think this is what he would say to you. I think he would, he would say this. He would say, know that your sacrifice, know that your generosity, know that your love, and most importantly, know that your faith is not in vain. Because the one you serve, he is alive. I saw it with my own two eyes. Your hope is not in vain. And if you're here and you're unconvinced, I think Peter would lean in and he would say this. He would say, I too was unconvinced. I, I had lost my faith. I, I had no hope. I didn't believe. I saw him die. But then, but then something happened. Something happened that changed everything. Jesus rose from the dead. And he would say that made all the difference. Jesus is for you. Jesus is for you. That's what Peter would say. Suddenly now he's understanding all the things that, that Jesus was saying, all the words that he was hearing, but he wasn't understanding. Suddenly all of it starts to make sense. The resurrection brings it all together. He says in Mark 1.15, he says, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe. That means turn to God and believe the good news. What's the good news? The good news is twofold. First of all, that Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for our sins. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. He went to the cross for our sins. But he didn't remain dead. He overcame death and he rose again from the dead. The resurrection and that same resurrecting power that was made evident in Jesus is available to you and I. That's the gospel. And what Peter was saying is just step into that today. Just step into that. Experience that today. Repent and believe the good news. And Peter would say he wants you to receive his invitation to follow. After all, Jesus brought the kingdom to earth. He brought the kingdom near and he brings it near to you. Everyone is invited. Everyone is invited to participate in it. You see, the message of Easter has never been more relevant than it is at this moment. And I hope it becomes more relevant to you. 
than ever before. As we wrap up our celebration of, of Christ's resurrection today, the day that death was defeated, I want to invite the band to come back. And they're going to lead us in the song that I mentioned earlier in the message. As we worship together, I pray that the words to these, this song, that the, the message that we, we considered today, that it would become more alive in us than ever before. As we consider who Jesus is and what he did. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the cross. For proving to us once and for all, for all how loved we are by you. For making a way for us when there was no way. Today we thank you for your willingness to sacrifice yourself for us. But we know, God, it doesn't end at the cross. God, we give you praise today. We gave you praise today because it was your power to overcome death that has become our living hope. And so today, God, today make this real to us. May we truly put our faith and trust in you as our living hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, let's give God some praise. He is, in fact, our risen Lord. He is our hope. We have hope. We have joy. We have peace because he is alive. He is alive. Amen. Well, I don't think we could hear a message like that and, and sing a song like that and not give people an opportunity to respond. Maybe for some of you today, God has just been drawing him to drawing you to him today. You can sense his invitation, his calling to you. The Bible says that uh, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe you're with your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from your sins, saved from yourself. Brought back to spiritual life. And today, he is inviting you into that new life. Maybe you're here today and, and, and you've been struggling. You haven't had faith. You haven't been able to believe me because you've been hung up on something. Maybe you had a bad church experience sometime in your life. You just lost, you lost faith because of that. Hear me today. Your faith does not start with some church. Your faith starts with a risen Savior, with Jesus who is alive today. Look to his resurrection. What was it that caused those disciples to continue to follow, to continue to believe, even when it meant that they would give their lives for their faith. If it were just some made up story, some fabricated lie, would they have been martyred for their faith? History tells us that, that Peter was crucified, but not wanting to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. History tells us that he was actually crucified upside down. What a horrible way to, to, to be executed. And yet, what drove Peter to the cross? It was his knowledge of a resurrected Savior. He had seen it with his very own eyes. And today, I hope that, that you are believing, maybe for the first time in your life, or you're coming back to that faith. You've let that, that, that leader or that church experience, maybe it's something that you read in the Bible that you just you didn't quite get. It, just, it, didn't, it didn't make sense to you. You're, 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 you've been hung up on that. Just go to the resurrection today. Know that he is alive. And once you come to that place and you experience new life in him, then watch how he begins to bring clarity and understanding in those other areas. But don't let those obstacles keep you from coming to him today. If he's been working in your heart and, and drawing you to him today, I want to give you the opportunity to respond. So I'm going to ask everybody in the room to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to lead you in a prayer. A prayer is just a conversation that we have with God. And it would be a prayer that does exactly what Peter suggested, that you would repent, turn to God, and accept his good news. So today, would you do that? 
Would you recognize that you're never going to earn your salvation? You're never going to earn your place with God. And the good news is you don't have to. You don't have to be perfect because Jesus was. You say, well, Ron, you don't know how badly I've messed up. It doesn't matter. Jesus paid the price on the cross for every sin that was committed. Past, present, and future. And today, today he wants to bring you new life. And you can invite him into your life right now just by crying out to him. So let me lead you in a prayer. There's nothing special, magical about these words. It's about your heart. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So let me give you that opportunity to begin that relationship or renew that relationship with Jesus today. God, I recognize that I've done some, some bad things. You call that sin. And that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. That he lived the perfect life and, and he stepped in my place. He took the punishment for me. And today, God, I, I recognize what he did in my place. I'm turning to him. And, and today, I want to I give him control of my life. I want to make him the Lord of my life. So today, God, today, I'm taking my first step with you because of the resurrection. So take my life, God. Make it yours. From this point on, God, I want to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before you lift your heads, keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer today, I'd, I'd love to just be able to pray for you uh, by faith. And so I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward or, or embarrass you in any way, I promise. But if you prayed that prayer today, uh, would you be bold enough just to lift a hand up real quick? Just say, I prayed that prayer today. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hands all over. Hand in the back. Yeah, I see that hand. Another hand down here. Today I prayed that. I see that hand in the middle. Thank you. Prayer. Yeah, hand over here. Thank you. Anybody else? You'd say, Ron, I, I, I made that step today. Amen. Well, the Bible says that when one person comes to repentance, they turn to God, all of heaven breaks out in jubilee. Can we join heaven right now? Because we had a whole bunch this morning. Praise God. Woo! Yes. Yes. He is worthy. He is risen. He is Savior. He is the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. What a day. What a day. Amen. Well, welcome to the family. I mean that. Um, listen, if you made that faith step today, we, we'd like to give you a gift. And you don't have to fill anything out. There, you don't even have to talk. Well, maybe a couple of words. Uh, but if you'd stop by our Connect desk out in the lobby and just say, had like one of those Bibles. We have this really cool Bible. It's for people that are, are new in this journey with God. And it's just got some helps in there to help you understand the Bible and the resurrection, the things we talked about today. It's amazing. That's our gift for you today. And uh, we've also got a little booklet in there, one of my favorite books I've ever read. It's called How Good is Good Enough. This, this, this is great. We want to put this in your hands. So just stop by. Uh, we had several people stop by after the nine and pick one of those up. Um, do that today because uh, we'd love to journey with you. And, uh, Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're so glad to have you. Don't forget about our block party next week. Make sure that you show up. We say this every single week. If you're new here, we don't want to just keep church here on Easter Sunday or any other Sunday. So if you know it, say it with me. We've been the church here. Now let's go be the church out there. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.